We're looking at trying to find ways to do what we call super staffing. Like the big idea here is not this like, oh, how do we get you 10% more efficiency in your nurses? The big idea here is, wait a minute, we probably only have a few hundred thousand chronic care nurses in the whole U.S. out of the 3 million total nurses. But we have 68 million people with two or more chronic diseases. Why don't we have 68 million nurses? And what would happen to healthcare outcomes if we did? Now, we can never do that in real life, right? But with language models, I think this is the big idea. So I call it my super staffing idea, which is this isn't about how we get 10% more efficient. This is about how do we 10x the number of healthcare workers? How do we use that then to finally deliver better access to healthcare than ever? I mean, everybody's been saying, I want better access to healthcare. I want better health equity. But everything they do is a zero-sum game. If you move more nurses to this underrepresented group, great. But then you took them from somewhere because you only have 3 million nurses to start with, even genetic counselors. If you get a genetic test in the U.S., for certain tests, they'll make you meet with the genetic counselor before you get the results. And there aren't enough genetic counselors. And genetic counselors don't actually do diagnoses. They just tell you the result and interpret it for you. I'm like, a language model could do that. And so, Are you sure? Yeah. Because I'm like, actually, I'm, I'm thinking. You should see like, these. Like, there's a lot of knowledge you need to properly do it. And there's a lot of new studies. And, you know, these things are pretty good at it. But not without us training it using genetic counselors. So, like, mm -hmm. if we launched a genetic counselor for doing this, it would be after a thousand genetic counselors rated our bot and said, it's ready to go. Rated our language model and said, you know what, I think it can go. So, we just have a different certification process before we'll put it out there. Yeah, I I have uh, maybe two comments there. And one is that I, um, like at HIMSS in Chicago, I heard a debate around, you know, patient access to data and should patients see, for example, the lab results immediately when they're available or not, or should the doctor see them first? Because sometimes it can happen that because patients won't understand on, or won't be able to interpret the results that they might get scared mm -hmm. uh, unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. And that's why you basically need that uh, right. consultation. So that's why mm -hmm. I thought, you know, your, your comment was um, interesting in terms of, you know, giving the results immediately when they're there, uh, because it does create a certain level of liability, maybe, if you're well, not 100% this, sure. This is actually the beauty of the language model, right? Right now, you're forced between a, a choice of unsupervised delivery of the information or supervised delivery super delayed because the doctors are not available or the nurses are not available. But now you can do both. You can have it supervised and instant. Now, is it as good a supervision as a human? I don't know. We'll see. I mean, so far, there is data that says it's got better bedside manner, right? And that's one of the big things we're building into our language model. Um, it's got more knowledge because it can literally have read every single PubMed paper on that study. I mean, on, on those genes and on that genetic test. Um, and so, you know, we'll have to see whether it all comes together. But I think that there's a, uh, there's a real opportunity here because it's instant. You mm -hmm. have an infinite number of them. Um, and, and it's supervised, meaning you can ask it. You can say, Hey, what does this really mean? Should I worry about this? Cause we've all done it. Like you look at the test and you're like, does this mean I have a fracture? Does this not mean I have a fracture? Like, I can't, I can't understand it. But if you could ask and they could explain it to you, um, then you get the benefit of instant and supervised at the same time. And I think that's the ideal. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the only question that could come up here is how do you make sure that the users can actually trust the model especially if they use something else before because for example um you know that's just the thing for example with chat gpt it's just so convincing that if you're not super skeptical mm -hmm. you might get deceived very quickly and i can give you an example so i was doing some research and i was i asked the chat gpt how many insurance companies does the netherlands have and it said five and it gave me names and i said doesn't it have 10 and it said Oh, yes, I'm sorry, there's 20. And it just gave out 20. And I'm like, Oh, no, but I think there's five. And it said, Oh, yeah, I'm really sorry. Yeah, there is five. So I'm like, Okay, this is definitely not something you should use to make sure yeah, yeah. if the data is right or not. Well, you're, so you're making my point for me, right? 
I mean, all the more reason you need it specifically trained for a domain. And mm -hmm. that might still not be enough to your point, but I think that you're, it's definitely not going to work unless you do that. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. um, and then the other part is you need the medical professionals who do that job today to say it's ready to launch. I mean, that's why we named the company Hippocratic. Right? I mean, I don't know how much more to say that we care about making sure it does no harm than naming it Hippocratic, making the tagline do no harm, and laying out all these steps on how we're going to design the, the product to be as safe as we can make it. But remember, most of your danger comes from diagnoses. And so everybody, even even in some of you know the conversations that I have with people, they keep bringing it back to diagnoses. <laughs> They're always like, oh, but in diagnoses, it'll be unsafe. I'm like, yeah, that's why I said, let's not do diagnoses. And I don't know, but, and again, they just keep doing that. Like I'll have the same conversation over and over again. And they'll be like, yeah, but in diagnoses, I'll be like, I just said, we're not doing diagnoses. And I, I don't know why they can't, like focus on all the other applications in healthcare. Take billing and explanation of benefits. Nobody in the U.S. understands their healthcare bill. <laughs> like, you get your bill and you're like, this is the most confusing thing I've ever seen. And it's a perfect thing for the language models to explain. And if you think about it, the, the risk is very low in that case. It could give you the wrong answer and still, it's probably still better than the human. A lot of times when you people, is this covered? Is that covered? They go, oh yeah, yeah, it's covered. And then later on, it doesn't get covered. The amount of incorrect information, because they haven't read the 200 page PDF on every single plan and even known how to interpret it, even if they have read it. Um, and so, you know, these models can absorb a very large amount of information and can, can work through it and, um, and can do it in a way that's sometimes much better than a human. And so I think that we'll see what happens, but there are many applications like that you know, take a preoperative nurse. Do you know what most of those questions are? Takes up nurse time and doctor time. And it's mostly people going, oh, can I, uh, you know, can I eat pizza two days after the operation? <laughs> Am I supposed to shave my leg before my knee surgery or will you guys shave it? I mean, I mean, it's understandable, right? You're about to be cut open. You are nervous. You have lots of questions. But most of those questions don't really require a doctor or nurse. And you can save the few that do for them, and you could save huge amounts of staff time. Like so you're actually you're actually saying that we could replace basically the missing uh, workforce, uh, yeah, individuals. Yeah, and, and or you can also super staff them. Meaning, it's not just the ones we need today to get to the level we've decided is is kind of our staffing today, but it's also this idea about. What's the ideal staffing that would have resulted in the best healthcare outcomes? Even if the math never worked before, what would have been the ideal staffing? And mm. if we got to that staffing, what would happen? So it's yeah, staffing is definitely a huge and growing issue. I think it's one of the topics that personally I find most worrying uh, because it's already getting increasingly more difficult to get to to medical care because of the lack of clinicians and consequently larger yeah. waiting lines, etc. Yeah. Uh, but it it still feels that nobody would ever dare to say that you know AI could replace people. It's not, a, in this case, it's not directly replacing uh, because the existing people will still be there. It's just there will be AI where people could potentially also be. Well, I think you have to think about where you can apply it rather than make it a broad general statement. Mm. I mean, when your test result is negative, meaning they found nothing, do you really need a human to call you up just to tell you they found nothing? Is that a good use of your scarce nurses? <laughs> 